Welcome to The Honest Channel. I'm Claire Johnston and usually in my content I'm exploring how to age well. And as a journalist I try to share information professionally and impartially so rarely do I share something that's particularly personal but I'm going to do that today. So around 18 months ago on this channel I spoke to the YouTuber and personal trainer Claudia Rolnick who has the Claudia Glows channel and who's also my friend. And she mentioned during our conversation that she had struggled in the past with anorexia. Now I didn't say at the time but I too had an eating disorder when I was in my 20s and like so many people I have wrestled and sometimes still wrestle with low self-esteem and anxiety and Claudia and I decided to share how those feelings contributed to developing an eating disorder and also our experience of living with an eating disorder. And we've recorded another conversation for Claudia's channel, which is linked below and includes even more of her story. But today you'll hear how and why food was an enemy for many years and how we managed to recover and turn that relationship around. I spent some time thinking about it, thinking, you know, is this something that I want to talk about or that would be helpful to talk about? One of the reasons I wanted to talk to you was... A, I knew you would, would be uh, sympathetic and um, I thought we could probably learn a lot from each other by talking about it. But also because, you know, I think as YouTubers, as people who talk about lifestyle and healthy lifestyle and nutrition and what we're doing, you know, in our 50s to, uh, you know, try and feel as good as we can for as long as we can. I wonder sometimes if you're somebody who is, um, you know, sitting at home and not feeling great about how you're eating, which we have both been in that place, knowing that we as people who sit there and, you know, to, to some extent, some people might think we pontificate about, you know, do this, don't do that. I just wanted to make clear to people that everybody they watch has their own issues and struggles and everybody's been through something and that we can all relate um, to uh, having a difficult relationship with food at some point and uh, to not feel down on themselves if they're in that position because it's it's completely normal it's um it's so common um and so today we're sort of chatting through our own experience but that's one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you was that so that people don't feel kind of alone with it if they feel that they are not eating as they should um, and they're looking at people on YouTube talking about optimal nutrition and they're feeling like I'm not even scratching the surfaces of that. It's like that's okay. A lot of us have been there and have had to pull our way through it as, as they're going to hear about today. I mean, how about you? How, why did you want to talk about this? Well, you just said, so people don't feel like they're not eating like they should. I think it's almost impossible to know nowadays what you should be mm -hmm. eating because there are so many conflicting opinions. Carnivore, vegan, this, that. There are so many conflicting opinions. Plus food has drastically changed. And I went to Costco yesterday for the first time in seven years. Mm. And I was shocked at the boxes and boxes of processed food that I wouldn't even consider food anymore at this point. So I think it is quite difficult to know nowadays what you should eat or what you shouldn't eat. And then you top that with our own emotional makeup and our own past and how we feel about our body and our own metabolism and all of those things. And I think it just becomes a big mess sometimes. Yeah. And uh, I, I say this a lot. I've been a personal trainer for half of my life. And while I have worked with people who have eating disorders, a lot of people I've worked with don't necessarily have an eating disorder, but they for sure have disordered eating because of all of these things mm -hmm. we just talked about. And I think it's quite rare to find somebody that is just completely healthy, has a completely healthy attitude about food and eats when they're hungry, stops when they're full, puts the right foods in their body. It's, it's quite rare because of all of those things. So that's why I wanted to talk about and also to share my own struggle with, I do consider myself quite healthy now, but I wasn't for most of my life. Yeah. 
I struggled yeah. with food for decades. Just to be upfront with people, I mean, you uh, struggled with anorexia for many years. I was bulimic for most of my 20s, um, on and off, but it was it was always there. And um, I kind of equate it with alcoholism a little bit in that I think that it's something that will always be with you to some extent. So, you know, it's it's under control, but I understand what the triggers were back then and um you know that the the thinking around food has to be just a little more cautious which you know we'll we'll come on to my particular issue started when i went to the states for to do a work america program in maryland and i worked in an all you can eat smorgasbord and we were offered lunch there and dinner so we we got most of our meals and i had absolutely no idea about what I was eating because I'd come come across the States, this naive girl from Scotland who was given these home cooked meals and we would have growing, grown up eating meat and two veg on your plate. That's kind of what you got for dinner. It was either fish or it was meat and your vegetables and quite conservative eating. And so to go to America and see all these amazing foods um, and the dessert Board. I mean, it was just ooh, blow my mind because I've got a, a sweet tooth and this stuff was just freely available. And um, I didn't actually think I was eating masses, but the weight piled on really fast. And I, looking back now, completely understand. I mean, I was eating uh, fried food, um, heavily processed food, and quite a lot of it. And it was enough to put on what was a couple of stone then. I went out eight stone. So what would that be? Like 112 pounds, something like that. And I remember my grandfather greeted me at the airport. And the first thing he did when he saw me was went. <laughs> and I thought, oh my goodness, you know, I thought it was, it was obviously very noticeable. And when I had been out there, um, I had been sitting with friends uh, we'd gone out for lunch one day and we'd gone to an all-you-can-eat diner, another one. And I remember eating a lot with them and thinking at one point, I can't process this. I can't handle processing what I've just eaten. And so I got up and I went to the toilet and that, that was the start of it. And when I came back from the toilet, I felt so ashamed. You know, I felt really like it brought out every ounce of shame that I'd grown up with and just kind of cemented it within me. Like, I can't control myself or, you know, I'm just a person who does this sort of thing. This is who I am. I've got this shady thing going on, you know? And um, so it just kind of escalated. The more I tried to kind of get to grips with it and couldn't get to grips with it, and the more confused I was around food, uh, so that when I got back to the UK, I did lose, start to lose a lot of weight because I was eating differently. I wasn't eating so many processed foods just because I'd gone back to my kind of old routine. But I couldn't quite get back to where I was because my relationship with food had changed fundamentally. I saw it now as a bit scary, a bit overwhelming. I don't know what I'm doing with it. The advice back then was all over the place. You know, don't eat fat at all, cut it out, you know, but you can load up on carbohydrates and low fat sauces. That's the way to lose weight. So that's what I did. And oh, didn't lose that much weight. Um, so I didn't understand uh, how, how to get on top of my eating. So what I did was I ate very little. And then when I, because I, you know, I, I, I couldn't stop the cravings for, I wanted something more than that, but I didn't trust what that would do for me. So in those situations, I brought it up, you know, I got rid of it. Um, and that carried on, you know, for, for a few years on and off, really, and then would disappear completely for a while. And I think I would think um, I'm over this and then something would trigger it. Um, and this is why I kind of equate it with alcoholism a little because, you know, somebody can be off booze for a while. And then out of nowhere, they go out on a drinking binge. And I kind of got that because something like somebody would say something at work 
You know, I'd have had a bad meeting where maybe somebody was critical of something and the shame, the feelings, the lack of self-worth starts running out of control. And I would find myself stepping out of the office and going and buying something, you know, a bunch of stuff to eat. And um, that's how I would deal with what was going on uh, was through food. And it eventually stopped um, in my late 20s when I met my husband. You know, it, 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 it'd been, I'd been on top of it, I think, for a little while before then. But that was when it really, you know, it stopped. I, I, I had my kids and, you know, my head was so full of parenting and everything else. And I think it, it started a journey of understanding more about food. And once I understood that eating naturally, just eating whole foods and, um, you know, that you can have the odd treat now and then, no problem really with that. But once I just got back to cutting out all the noise around do this, do that, and just focusing on those whole foods, eating as nature intended, um, I, I was able to maintain a weight and um, feel at peace with food again. So that was really, in a nutshell, that kind of experience, but it was so wrapped up in feelings of self-worth and lack of self-worth. And I think that is something I have struggled with for decades in my life and is another reason I'm so keen to talk about it really, because I see so much potential in other people and I, and I see them put themselves down and I understand it and I've been there and I don't want them to waste as much time as I did on having those conversations with themselves when in reality we don't have to live like that, you know. Um, so, I mean, that was me and um, I know that you had a kind of longer journey. Would you mind taking us back? I mean, you, you talk more on your channel about this and um, thank you for being so so open with me. Would you mind taking us back to, to when it kind of first started for you? Oh, of course. But I wanted to say really fast, you said that feeling of not being enough. I think that's one feeling that connects all of us human beings. I think yes. that every single one of us human beings has this fear of not being enough. Even the ones, the ones we think don't have it, the ones that overplay it, you know, have it the most. I think we all have a certain coping 100%. mechanism. We try to not feel that feeling, but I think it's a universal feeling amongst human beings that not enoughness. Yeah, absolutely. I look back at some of the bosses that I had and they were kind of bullying and they were noisy. And I look at them now and I think today, if I met somebody like that, I would be really concerned about their mental health and the way they were behaving because they were just spiraling. Uh, those days that was seen as strength. Actually, it was just uh, fear, complete fear that had taken over. So yeah, we all have it and it, it manifests in different ways with us. Um, so some people could be overeating and, and um, feeling all the confusion of that and the shame of that and just feeding into that lack of self-worth. But we're all the same. Um, and that's probably how my story started too, mm. not feeling enough. You know, I grew up with a very cold and distant mother who always told me she would never have me again. Oh. It was a big mistake to have us, my sister and I. And so, of course, and I was supposed to be a boy. My dad always told me how disappointed he was that I wasn't a boy. So <laughs> I wasn't, you know, I wasn't enough, obviously, the way I was. So... The way my mom knew to give love was through food. That was the only love we got. She would stuff us to the point where our cheeks were nice and rosy and fat. And people would say, you know, this is the early 70s. People would say, look how healthy these children are. But very early on, I decided if this is the only love I get, I don't want any of it. Mm -hmm. So very early on, I refused to eat. I got punished for it and eventually it turned into me doing the opposite and eating according to my mother, too much. And then she would take me from doctor to doctor saying, why is my daughter eating so much? And so my whole childhood food was this, this thing that was as close to love as I got. 
but also something I should feel guilty about wanting and guilty about consuming. And it was very confusing, the whole thing. And my mother had a very strange relationship to food. So at about age 16, I, I lost a couple of pounds, which looking back now at pictures, I didn't need to lose. But there was suddenly a lot of attention paid to my figure, especially by my mother's boyfriend, who was um, very inappropriate to my sister and I. So I think that triggered something in my head that if this man is attracted to me now, that's not a good thing. Mm -hmm. It's dangerous. And I decided I want to lose more weight. I didn't consciously decide I want to lose more weight to become anorexic or to be unattractive. But I think in hindsight, that's sort of what that was. So I educated myself on calories back then. We thought, you know, calorie in is a calorie out. We know now that's not quite that simple, but learned about every single food, how many calories did it have in it, counted every single calorie. If I would squeeze some lemon in my water, I counted that, mm -hmm. but not as 10 calories, but as 100, just to be on the safe side. <laughs> so I overestimated greatly just to be safe. Of course, I lost weight really quickly. And then at the same time, I started running. So really quickly, I was eating about 500 calories, which I thought was 500, was maybe like 300, and running up to 20 miles a day. It still blows my mind to this day what the body is capable of doing. I did this for years and years and years. Mm -hmm. Of course, I had all kinds of injuries. But how the body can survive, it's pretty incredible. So... I then was hospitalized. My mother put me into an institution, into a psychosomatic institution. And um, I was there against my will. I was only 17, so I didn't really have any say in it. Didn't really. I, I, I sort of went along in the therapy. <laughs> it was Freudian therapy. It wasn't very helpful. It was just, well, what do you think? <laughs> you know, and, it wasn't, and what do you think as a 17-year-old, you know? So I just sort of bit my time, did the same thing there, ate very little. I ran every morning, snuck out sometimes twice a day. I even ran my first race in that clinic and ended up winning it. Gosh. And I got a big trophy that weighed more than I did back then. So I stayed in that clinic, clinic until I turned 18, then said I want to get out. My therapist said, I wouldn't advise that. But if you do, you have to move out from home because he knew that my mother and her boyfriend were the source of it. So I did. I got an apartment at 18 and just was living it up, <laughs> just doing the same thing, not eating, running every day. You know, I had learned in the clinic, okay, these things happen to you, right? But what do I do with it? I wasn't given any tools. And I wasn't willing yet because I didn't have the tools. I wasn't willing yet to give up this disease. I had so much control suddenly in my life. Control was lacking my whole childhood. Suddenly I had something that I was controlling and that I was good at, and I wasn't going to give that up. And you talked about being bulimic, and while anorexia and bulimia are both eating disorders, they're actually quite different. Mm. You know, you talked about the shame, and this sounds so arrogant now, and I'm almost ashamed to admit it, but as an anorexic, you're proud that you don't eat. You look at everybody that eats and goes, oh, don't need this. So there isn't yeah. that shame, there is that, you like, I'm control. proud of that. Yeah, I'm in control. Mm -hmm. I don't need to do any of it. Whereas I felt I had spiraled completely out of control. Um, but you yeah. don't want to give up that control, you know, for the first time in my life, I thought, I'm not going to give that up. So it, uh, it took me quite a long time. I, um, I was saying earlier on my channel, I, I kept going like that until one day in my, I think I was 21, I rode my bike back from work. I was training to be a PA at that time. And I, I was so exhausted by, I was exhausted by my own head. And I had this very clear thought that I wish I was just dead. And at that same moment, a car hit me. <laughs> it was the strangest intervention. It was like God said, let's just see about this one. So I laid under that car and I looked up at the undercarriage and I said, no, I, I changed my mind. I don't want to be dead, but I can't do this anymore. I want to be healthy. It's extraordinary. So, it is like a thunderbolt <laughs> coming down, I know. isn't it? It was at the same time. And yeah, I wasn't wearing a wow. helmet, you know, I was under that car. I had a hole in my head. And so anyways, I made myself a promise to go back to that clinic and get more help. And I did. I went back for another six months, this time on my own. I really wanted to heal. And I healed a little bit more. But again, it was that same, well, what do you think? There were still no tools given. Okay, now I know exactly why I'm doing all these things. You know, I had a crappy childhood, all of these things. 
but where do I go from there? So for another almost two decades, I continued doing what I did. Not quite as extreme. You know, when I got out of the clinic the second time, I weighed maybe 100 pounds wet. I'm 5'8", so that's nothing. I don't know how much I weigh now because I don't weigh myself, mm -hmm. but I'm assuming about 130. So I continued doing what I did for another few decades, over-exercising. I had to exercise three and a half hours or more a day or else it wasn't okay. So three hours wasn't enough and just ate a certain amount of calories. And every calorie I ate, I, I kept track of, you know, still overestimating. And it was difficult to connect to people because my mind was constantly mm -hmm. thinking about those things. I couldn't yeah. really, I had, I met some wonderful people, you know, some wonderful men and I couldn't connect with them because nor could I love them because I wasn't loving myself and I couldn't connect with them because my mind was just constantly thinking about There's an about obsession, stuff. yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But if you saw me from the outside, you just thought, wow, this is a very fit, driven person, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. which in the 90s, that's what you wanted to be. You know, you wanted to be this driven. And I was a really good athlete. I wasted all my talent, unfortunately. But yeah, it took me a long time to give up a little less and a, and a, a little more control and a little more control and a little more control. It took a lot of different pieces falling into place. It took more therapy. Yeah. It took, and I said this earlier, as cliche as it sounds, it took really learning to love myself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and knowing that I'm enough. Because like I said, I think that is the, the feeling all of us have for not enough for whatever yeah. reason. And knowing that I'm enough. And the funny thing is when I learned that, I didn't just want to be enough. That then wasn't enough. Then I wanted to be more than enough. Yeah. <laughs> There's always that overachiever mind, right? So also realizing that enough is enough. Mm -hmm. I don't have to be more than I don't have to be skinnier than skinnier than everybody else or faster or this or that, you know, I'm enough. Yeah. So learning that the right people coming into my life and the wrong people who gave me the gift of having to relook at certain things and healing them, getting older, you know, just caring a little less about stuff and realizing what mm -hmm. is important. So it took a lot of different pieces to fall into place. It wasn't a linear recovery. There were a lot of dips in it a lot of pieces to fall into place. However, you were talking about triggers earlier. I'm not quite sure what my triggers were, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I think that that anorexia was just always there. It mm -hmm. was never like it was gone for a few months. There were times where it was worse and times where it was better, but it was always there. So I think the trigger was just me not feeling enough and me wanting control. I think although they are quite different, there was an element of control with me as well because if I felt I had eaten more than I was willing to process, I was afraid of what would happen if I processed, digested that food. Um, that was my way of controlling it was, you know, the cheats way, just getting rid of it. But at the same time, in my home, I was buying very little food. So my mum would come through to visit me, you know, um, I was living in a different city to her at the time and she would open my fridge and there would be like nothing in it. So one time they came through and they tried to fill my fridge with food and I, I was panicked, absolutely panic stricken. And it wasn't just about the fact that we were putting all that food in there and, you know, was I going to eat it? It was more the fact, it was just the, like the loss of control of I liked clean surfaces. I liked order in my fridge, just a few things. It was my way of trying to settle a, cha a chaotic mind probably at the time of youth, of so many critical thoughts and um, so much going on in my head that I needed that order in my life. And um, and food was one of the ways, so I'd eat the same things every day. You know, I had the same sandwich for my lunch at work. And, I, you know, and if it, then I tipped into something where I lost control and had something else, that was when the problem would start with me. And I would, I would take the the option out. But seeing a therapist um, when I was in my mid-twenties, when I was going through another bout, it would flare up and then, you know, I would I would get on top of it a bit more and then flare up again. So during a flare up, when I went to see a therapist, that was a turning point because she connected it with emotion and asked me before I had an episode like that. So when I was, when it was my plan and there was no stopping it, and it was, that was my plan, I was going to do it. 
she asked me to think about, you know, just, just try to capture what I was feeling. And, you know, it was often loneliness happened a lot when I was living on my own. Um, it was loneliness, isolation, and just total lack of self-worth uh, when it really boiled down to it. Um, was not feeling good enough. Had a very religious background. Went to church four times on a Sunday when I was growing up. And um, we heard about sin all the time. We were just, we were sinners, you know, and it kind of put a mark on me. Like, yeah, that's what I am. And, uh, you know, I couldn't hang out with my friends on a Sunday. So that kind of isolated me from them. So I think it always gave me this sense of just not quite fitting in, having this, I wouldn't talk to them about church. So I always had a guilty secret. And bulimia was a, just another guilty secret, just another thing to feel shameful and bad about that kind of completed the picture that was following me and that, you know, I was carrying with me. Um, and I think a lot of people have that around food. It's, it's just another way to dislike themselves. It's another manifestation of them not liking themselves and thinking that they should be something different and something better. And then one of the things that helps me a lot now, actually, you know, because I think I've, I've struggled with lack of self-worth through my entire life. And I listen to some of these brilliant self-development coaches out there now. I mean, I listen to Ed Milet and, you know, all of them, the, the gang, Lewis Howes, Jay Shetty, brilliant podcasters, great on self-development. They are all um, vulnerable and they all talk about, you know, particularly Ed Milet, you know, he'll talk all the time about having, f still having feelings of a lack of self-worth, uh, still feeling like an imposter. And I used to think it was just women because women are, are more open. And I, at work, um, I, I left my job recently to, to focus on my own content. But I, in my last job, I started something called the Imposters Club and it was a group of women and we used to uh, meet online for a little chat because I discovered that all these brilliant women that I worked with, that I admired so much, felt utterly shitty about themselves and like they were waiting to be found out. I thought, what is this? And wanting to help them actually accelerated my own, um, I think, recovery from lack of self-worth in a way because I looked at them and I thought, hang on, something's wrong here you are brilliant. What do you mean you don't think you're good enough? And I felt so angry almost about that. Like we've wasted so much potential that I thought that's it. I'm shutting it down. I'm shutting it down. I don't care what I'm supposed to be. It's, it's enough. You know, now you and I both uh, like to think we're healthy eaters, but I think we've both kind of got a similar mindset around food now, which is not to be too hard, not to go on a diet, um, because that can, that can set us up for failure. If we start getting into the dieting mindset, uh, then if we don't meet our little target or whatever we've set out for ourselves, that's when the problem starts. So yeah, um, I think you're similar to me in that you, you cut yourself some slack sometimes. So I eat chocolate every day, um, and I can just limit myself to one or two bits, but that's, I've allowed myself that because you know what, the rest of the time I'm, I'm eating well and I kind of feel like as if that's what I need to do um, to both enjoy food because I really enjoy food, but also not to get into the mindset of I cannot have that. And if I have that, it's a problem because once I start talking to myself like that, I feel like I might fail. And if I fail, the critic's going to come back on in my head you failed. So I don't set myself up for failure, basically. You know, when I sort of recovered, right? I mean, like I said, it was a long process. When I finally realized, okay, you have to be good to yourself. You have to eat more. There were times then when I ate so much because I had this huge hole inside of me, right? Not just because I hadn't eaten in decades, but still this emotional hole that I hadn't healed. I would eat so much that I would just feel sick. I was just like, I can't do that anymore now. Mm -hmm. Because now I'm really happy to say I have a healthy relationship with food. I eat chocolate every day. I have four bars of chocolate back. <laughs> I love chocolate. I eat dark chocolate. 
I think, mm-hmm. you know, it's rich in antioxidants. But I look at food now as nourishment. Mm-hmm. And I look at it just like if I had a really high-end sports car, I would put the best gas in there. I want to do that with my body. I want to put the best nutrients in my body that are available to me right now. I look at it for the most part as this is what I'm putting in my body so that my body can do what it wants to do so that I can live life. And so now when I'm full, I'm full. It's like, this is all I need. I can't, I don't have that emotional hole anymore that I have to fill. Yeah. Which is such a lovely feeling because for the longest time I didn't have that. But like you too, I wouldn't diet. I don't fast, even though it is supposed to be good for us. I have my own opinion on that, but supposedly it's good for us, you know, extends lifespan. Like you, I'm more for healthy lifespan. Mm -hmm. And healthy lifespan to me doesn't just mean physically, but it also means emotionally. And life is short. I've starved myself for too long. Yeah, and and we've ended up in a very similar place, funnily enough, because I, that's also how I look at food. It's like, uh, you know, I look at the the nutrients. I'm not very calculated about that. I'm not like I need to make sure I get X number, but, you know, I just have a kind of general philosophy of eating a... I'd like to get variety in vegetables, different colours, um, You know, I think that if we get enough uh, nutrients in the day, eat a nourishing diet that's based on whole foods, it is quite incredible how your, it just kind of balances. I I wonder even if chemically in the brain, you know, has that helped? Because you don't really crave in the same way. You don't get the sugar crashes or anything like that because you're kind of, you know, you're eating whole foods, you've got these natural fats in there as well that keep you fuller longer, you're getting a wide range of nutrients, it's it's all promoting gut health, which we know is so important. And what they're learning now is that actually um, those plant-based fibres that help our gut health so much, that make us feel satiated, it's a very similar um, impact on the body as a, something like a Zempic. I think that if, if you can get into that zone of eating like that. It it helps in so many ways. It really does. It's been a sort of wholesale change for me. I feel so much better. But that's the difficult part too. You know, that's I had this long conversation with my husband yesterday after Costco because he's an economist and he's like, well, this is the reality. It's convenient, it's easy, it's cheap. And so that's what people want to eat. The problem with these foods is they hit your dopamine receptors every single time mm. you eat them. And the more you hit those dopamine receptors, the more they blunt out and the more of that food you need to hit them. So it becomes an addiction. Food mm-hmm. can literally be an addiction, just like not eating can be an addiction. My dopamine receptors were fed by not eating. It, fasting can do that yes. as well. So it's that. It's the not being enough. It's the confusion around food. You know, it took us a long time to get where we are. So mm-hmm. I want people to know if you're not there, it's totally okay because we yeah. live in a world where it is so difficult and where it's purposefully difficult for people to want to eat healthy foods because there's no money in you know selling mm-hmm. you a bunch of apples, <laughs> but yeah. there's a lot of money into selling you crap because you yeah. get addicted to it and you want to keep eating to get the dopamine fix. Mm-hmm. And then the more you do that, not only you know is your brain chemistry getting different than if you eat whole foods and that gut microbiome produces your your neurotransmitters, but you feel shitty about yourself. Now you feel even less than, and it's this vicious cycle that really the world we live in sort of just feeds. And it's really, really challenging for people, I think, nowadays to just have a healthy relationship with food. I I know the conversations people will have with themselves because I've had them with me. It's like, you know, well, why can't I get on top of this? Why do I want all this stuff? Why can't I control it? Um, And we are being set up for failure with the kind of stuff that's put into these foods. Um, And just like I piled all that weight on because I didn't understand, I would think that something was just a bun, just a harmless little bun. Had no idea of the level of sugar and fat and everything that was put into this this little bun. so, you know, I think I, I get it. I get it. It sounds like such a thought um, when you're just starting from scratch. It really does. And I, I think if people can take a step by step, celebrate the, the little wins. If you've if you've eaten slightly less sugar today than you did yesterday and you've got some fresh vegetables in there um, or you're deliberately trying to include them with each meal now, you know, these are wins and they'll lead somewhere. Um 
every little win helps adding to the self-esteem. What we have to watch is where we think we've failed or fallen down, getting into that cycle of, oh, here I go again. I just can't do it, you know? Whereas um, we all have those days, we all have those feelings. You just keep going. The next one will be better. <laughs> You're moving in the right direction just by trying. Exactly. And you just brought up the little bun, right? This highly processed bun. And I think that's what a lot of people also don't realize, like you didn't. They're like, but I'm just eating this little bun. I thought it was low calorie. You know. It's low but processed food, and there are many studies on this, processed food affects our metabolism completely different mm -hmm. than whole foods. And they have done studies with mice where they eat the exact same calories, the exact same food, but one of it was puffed up a little bit, so it was processed. Those mice gained fat. Yeah. Even though they ate the same food, same calories, but it was just differently processed. And I think people eat that, they're like, well, it's low calorie, and then they gain weight, and now they beat themselves up even more. What's wrong with me? I'm doing everything right. So there needs to be more education around food. Try to yeah. be a bit kinder to yourself. We were saying earlier, if that voice that we hear every single day was outside of us, hopefully within a few seconds, we would say, shut up and get away from yes. me. But we do it to ourselves all day long. Yeah, I think you and I have a very strong self-critic in us that we have learned how to shut down you know some days that critic in me can get a lot louder and it's harder to shut it down but i will get there eventually but um it's it's something that obviously has been very strong in both of us to to drive more extreme behaviors and difficulties around food and um accepting myself and um i think also realizing that if i'm somebody who believes in equality who believes everybody is equal, that includes me. That has to include me. I said that to a friend recently who was so down on herself. And I said, you're somebody who really believes in equality. Well, can't you count yourself in? You know, it's, it, it, it's, it's I, I think it's moments like that that have dawned on me in life. You know, a, another brilliant piece of advice that I heard was somebody saying, never attach your confidence to your skills and abilities, because they'll never be enough. And to somebody like me, that was absolutely crucial because no matter what I did, it was never enough. And um, they said, instead, ta attach it to your intentions. You know, and could you imagine how many brilliant people are out there who are carers, working in healthcare, give so much to other people on a daily basis and then go home and beat themselves up? because they can't control their weight and how much worth these people have and living such a well-intentioned life and not giving themselves a moment's credit for it. It's my hope that in some small way, having conversations like this does at least help somebody who might feel a little isolated, feel like, you know, no, everybody else doesn't have it together. It's not just you. But I'm I'm so glad you made it, Claudia. I'm so glad we got to know each other. Um, Me too. Then I've got a, a friend and an ally on, on YouTube and, and somebody who has come through quite a, a similar experience and we've ended up in a similar place. So thank you for being here. Thank you. I'm really proud of you. I know what it takes to overcome that. So I'm really proud of you. No. Right back at you. <laughs> and thank you so much for having me. There's little point in bringing up the struggles of our past if they don't help us create a better today. So it's my hope that by hearing how Claudia and I experienced low self-worth, which affects so many of us, poor body image, as well as struggles with eating, that if it's something you experience in any form, you'll be able to at least take away the awareness that it is common and it can be overcome, whether it's overeating, undereating, or something else. And there's a lot of help and support available today and I will link in the description below to some resources. But for now, thank you for being here today.